So, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Fairhurst and it's great to be back here in the Philippines doing this conference. It's one I've done many years in a row and uh, hopefully we won't have any more uh, interruptions in the years to come. Some of you may recognize me um, and since we last all met in person, I've done a career change. So if you need market modeling, don't come and ask me, go and find Chris because I'm no longer with uh, the Lantau Group. I've now pivoted and I'm doing a number of roles as a non-executive board director, including Equus Developments, as Kathleen mentioned, but also here in the Philippines, PCPC and Jackie, um, and in Singapore, Genesis Ray, which has got some great technology to support people developing renewable projects, um, and, and also some uh, standalone advisory work. But this, uh, let, let's get on to this topic. Um, Equus Developments has actually done some uh, solar and storage in uh, South Korea, which I had uh, the privilege to go and visit in April of this year. And it really is fascinating how you can combine renewable energy with storage and create something which is so much more than the sum of the two parts. And that's really what this panel here is, is all about. And one of the things we heard yesterday uh, is that uh, DUs in the Philippines, um, I think Muralco was mentioned, are looking to procure dispatchable renewables. And, and that's really what um, one of the things that a combination of renewables with storage provides, and that's dispatchability. Uh, but here in this panel, we'll be looking at the other niches um, and the other drivers for renewable uh, storage hybrids. Um, and I'm hoping we'll be able to touch on uh, a question that's always been uh, top on the list of my mind, and that is, is a dispatchable hybrid the way to go, or should we be looking at gas in the future? Um, is it a choice, or are we looking at both? Um, and what are the drivers for this? But first of all, let's kick off with uh, letting each of our um, panelists introduce themselves and, and tell us a little bit about what, uh, what, what they find interesting about um, renewable hybrids. David, do you want to uh, kick us off there? Hi, Sarah. It's nice to see you again. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm David Evangelista, currently with Vivan. I'm an energy professional for the past 15 years, 15 or most, or most years. Started my career developing wind energy up in the north and then started building fuel efficient technology in my previous company and built the first efficient fossil fuel power plant in the Philippines. Since December, I moved to Vivanta Energy Corporation developing uh, renewable energy projects and hybrid projects. And we also provide practical solutions to off-grid areas. Vivant, by the way, is a Cebu-based energy company we're an energy company involved in distribution through the Visayas Electric Corporation and doing RE projects in off-grid and on-grid. Matter of pride for us is we are the largest rooftop commercial and industrial company. We're also the second largest off-grid operator and developer in the country. And now we're venturing into on-grid projects for RE and ancillary services. RE meaning uh, renewable, battery and solar, and combinations of which, including liquid fuel power plants providing ancillary services. Thanks very much, David. Nick. Hi, my name is Nick Dizan. You may be wondering by my company name, it says Nidon Computer Corporation, and we are doing business as Nidon Clean Energy. We started out as a tier one IBM mainframe uh, service company. And then uh, as an IBM mainframe service company, we were building uh, data centers and putting in the air conditioning, the backup power UPS. So back in uh, 1999, uh, I built the Hawaiian Airlines data center and I decided to investigate renewable energy because uh, UPS with battery and generator, uh, we're very familiar with backup power and power quality came to the realization over the, the next several years after that, that energy storage would be key to the renewable energy future, and that the weaknesses of renewable energy were in power converters, power electronics, and energy storage. If you can solve that, you have the future. So that's what, we, that's what Nidon's focused on, and we've been 
successfully doing that now for the past several years, albeit in the United States. Thanks, Nick. Hansel. Hello, everyone. My name is Hansel Kubangbang. And I'm the market senior, senior market applications officer for Southeast Asia Qwets. Qwets, by the way, is a global provider of energy storage products, solutions, services, as well as digital applications for renewable energy and energy storage. We have more than 5.1 gigawatt of uh, awarded projects in 44 countries around the world. In fact, we built the first energy storage in Southeast Asia and that's in Musim Maximalis. And we did our second in Cabangkalan, Negros. So it's great to have some people who really have uh, an understanding of the different aspects of the renewable hybrid uh, environment. So what I'd like to do is to ask each of you panelists, really, uh, you know, what, what is hybrid renewable and energy storage in your view? I think you each have slightly different views of how you want to uh, characterize uh, this topic. And then what are the specific advantages that hybrids have in the Philippines? Hansel, let me kick off with you, because um, I think you probably have the most traditional view being a, a battery supplier. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure. So, yeah, in my own personal uh, definition, hybrid renewable energy are systems that consist of two or more renewable energy resource and energy storage and by combining two or more renewable energy storage, by doing hybrids, we increase the flexibility, efficiency, and we increase as well the capacity factors compared to a standalone car. Oh, that was that was very succinct. Uh, let me go. I'm going to put you last, actually, Nick. I'll go to David next. To add to Hansel's definition, for us, hybrid is a combination of technology to provide practical solutions to energy requirements. When I say combination of technology, we're not limited to just RE plus battery. In off-grid areas, off-grid needs fuel, uh, fossil fuel, in the case of diesels, or sometimes, well, currently diesel or bunker fuel. It needs to be practical because although it needs a semblance of renewable, we also have to be realistic that there are opportunities then that diesel is required to power the grid. Let's say, for example, a storm hits a, an offshore area, off-grid area. There's no sun. Wind may just be too destructive, but hospitals need power. You turn on your diesel engines. Now, while that diesel engine is uh, providing electricity, every generation need not be dispatched immediately. They need to power a battery, which serves as an emergency source of battery when the diesel runs out. So for us, hybrid needs to be practical, not limited to RE, needs to have storage so that it can be dispatched later on, and preferably with an RE component. That's great. Thank you. Nick, I think you have some, some different uh, aspects you want to touch on. I'm probably the geekiest guy of the panel. So um, for me, hybrid energy storage is also equal to hybrid energy. So what is that? That can be a simultaneous combination of wind, solar, hydro, diesel, gas, all right? And also that's all on the charging side. And it can also include utility. So any source of energy we want to combine two, three, four, five of those simultaneously into a central system. That central system and then can be supported by two, three, four, five energy storage solutions. Why? The reason is that the enemy to energy storage is repeated uh, high motor inrush currents. I don't know how much of you know about batteries. Most people think of a battery as in your car or your flashlight. When you turn on a flashlight, the draw on that battery is fixed. When you go into an electric car, the load that that, that battery is supporting is known by the engineers who designed that car. When you're doing renewable energy that's going to a load, that's mystery meat. All right? And that mystery meat can destroy your energy storage and make your energy storage not 
financially pencil out. Therefore, a hybrid energy solution actually is the way to address that. So now, the, the key to this is how you combine those things together because it's complex algorithms, it's math. There's no getting around it. You see these guys nodding. The math is complex and normal developers, that math is beyond them. They don't do that every day. He's starting to do that. He's starting to do that. In the United States, we've been doing that for 20 years and we still don't have it exactly right. So Nick, when I listen to your definition, you're combining solar and wind and diesel and, and, and a hydro and also battery storage. Um, I just hear you have a grid. Because, I mean, that, that's really what we have when, 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 when you look around at the WESM, you know, we have, we have solar, we have wind, we also have coal, we have diesel, we have hydro. What makes a hybrid project different from all of these things just existing in the grid at the same time? Well, the issue is, and the developers have to deal with this all the time with Morocco or National Grid, is the interconnect. All right. So if you have a large renewable energy project that you want to feed into the grid, you need it to be firm, you need it to be predictable, it needs to fit that part of the load that it's connected to. All right. Now that's a whole bunch of issues. If you know what that load situation is, that helps you determine what type of renewable energy, what combination of renewable energy, and therefore what combination of energy storage you need to satisfy that grid connection. Now, the other thing you don't want to do is ever have curtailment. You want that interconnection to be so firm. And of course, if the cost of that electricity is cheaper than coal or gas, now we're talking about a, a, a financial business model that will really work because we've well, made it let, cost let, effective let me, and reliable. Let me pause you there, Nick, because I can understand why you would need a firm output if you are in an off-grid situation, as David was, was saying, or if you are directly supplying a large industrial customer who's you know, very keen on having a, essentially their own solution. But there is no need at all to be firm if you're just feeding into the grid. Well, the grid, the grid fluctuates, right? You have your morning peak, you have your evening peak, and in the United States, we have so much solar and wind energy that effectively, Below the substation, there's no power coming from the, from the uh, generators at all, from the spinning copper, from the oil or gas. So what you, what you need is a, a system that intelligently, dynamically adapts to the load. Ah, so you're, you're talking about the future, when, we have, when, when the coal has been turned off and when there's no more gas and we don't have the inertia, the spinning inertia of those plants. Well, it's the variation the of the load. I mean, in the evening, that's the, the, which is a big problem across California now. Everybody comes home, they turn on the air conditioners, they, their water heaters go on, they turn on the stove, there's this huge spike. While that spike of energy is going on, solar and wind is dropping off a cliff. All right. What you need is a renewable energy system that dynamically adapts and fits to that rise to cut off that, satisfy the duct curve, this is how you can truly leverage the value of your renewable energy. And that's why they're looking at that four hour evening peak window. If you've got a hybrid energy storage solution that can address that evening peak, you've solved the problems of the world on energy. Okay, well I'm gonna park the difference between solar and storage in the grid versus solar and storage as a hydrant feeding into the grid, because I think we may want to pick it up later. Um, but why don't we, uh, we take another uh, look at uh, other aspects of the grid, and, and that is, uh, in the Philippines, how do you connect to it? Um, Hansel, I mean, I, have you come across any, uh, any issues trying to get a grid connection here in the Philippines? Yeah, I did. Uh, yeah, basically, the, the main issues right now, as I see it, in, in the Philippines is more on the interconnection process. Uh, I heard uh, yesterday one of the panels said that they have to secure more than 300 permits, right? So that 300 permits would take a lot of time. And for, for us to, to encourage investors to come in, we really need to streamline the process. 
not only on the SIS or the facility study of the national grid, but the interconnection process in general. Yes, we have the EVOS or the Energy Virtual One Stop Shop or system, but yeah, we just have to improve, we just have to make it more comprehensive. Because right now, I believe, even though we have the EVOS, we still have to separately access websites of other government agencies. So it's not yet there, but we, we, we have to make it more comprehensive to fully realize the objective of the EVOS. And I mean, you've done an actual uh, hybrid uh, project, David. Did you find any difference uh, connecting to the grid for a hybrid project than for your simpler projects? Right now, Sarah, to get the connection agreement from the national grid will take you two years. Three years, three months to secure the service contract to get you the DOE endorsement for the NGCP. And the NGCP will then queue your project when they can provide a service. That takes up to, right now, 14 months. So, service contract, three months. DOE endorsement, a week. 14 months of just getting the service. That's already 15. And then you negotiate the connection agreement. Another eight months. That's more than two years. So the challenge for interconnection is getting the actual document, allowing a project to connect to the grid. And is that harder for hybrid? It's not necessarily more difficult. It's just that hybrid now competes with the non-hybrids, with the fossil fuel, and with more grid-connected smaller projects there's just so many projects in queue. But you would you would think, to take Nick's point, that a hybrid project would have a higher level of certainty with its connection. It would put less strain on the grid when it does connect. You would actually think that a hybrid project should be welcomed by the grid and accelerated. Are you seeing any indication that NGCP understands that? That NGCP understands that? Yes. But the policy and the process to get there is not in place. So let's say so a standalone solar project secures its DOE endorsement ahead of me. There's no way I can get ahead of that project, even if I'm hybrid. NGCP accepts that there's need to be more ancillary. But the standalone solar was ahead of me, and I can't get ahead of him. Yeah, that's a, a real worry, I think, if we're not seeing intelligent queuing. Agree. Thank you. Did you have anything to add, Hansel? Yeah, yeah. in the Philippines, uh, it's a good thing that our policies, or most of our policies, are, are tries to be as energy neutral as possible. But I believe there should be specific grid connection requirements, rules, and standards for hybrids. Because right now, I think the standards are only for standalone RE and other generators, but we don't have a specific rules for hybrid. For example, a wind and a solar hybrid. What should be followed? What provision should be followed under the Philippine Grid Code? What rules to be followed? Yes, they, they, they have realized the benefit of going hybrid, but right now I think it's unclear to me or maybe lacking in terms of the rules uh, in support of hybrid renewable energy. It sounds like we do need some education of the policy makers, and it's a great shame we don't have any of them in the audience. Um, but good luck, and uh, I hope you can uh, both work to, to solve these problems. So, I mean, it probably brings us now on to policy. Um, other than the fact that they appear to be a more intelligent way to connect to the grid, is there any other reason why we should need a special policy for uh, renewables and storage hybrids? Yeah, as I said earlier, yeah, the, the policies are as energy neutral as they can be. We just have to have that rules and regulations for hybrid. Because right now, we, we, when we talk to the investors, we kind of uh, worry about, okay, what are the rules for hybrid? Should we follow the standards for wind? or for solar, when we combine the wind and solar. So that sort of thing right now, it's very unclear to, to, to us or to even to, to the investors. So it's really, I think, as somebody said yesterday, the policy is lagging the technolo technology by really quite some margin. Yeah. Sarah, for me, 
the NGCP is a private company overseen by the Department of Energy. The wish for us for policy is to just have a firm timeline, actually two. One is to have a firm timeline to get grid connection approved. Studies are scientific. They're technical. They can be done with specific times. They don't have to drag us long. Now, do, does NGCP need extra people to work on grid uh, studies? They can be outsourced. But the approval process may need some policy support to fast track. That's for so, so is that approval process for NGCP does that occur, I mean, are, are the same people working on all of those projects across the whole country? Or, you know, are there some areas which have, you know, more capability to, to move faster than others? Unfortunately, for a connection agreement, it's the same signatories the entire country. So it's just one group. Ansel, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I think for, for the studies, for the SIS and facility study, there's a regionalized team. So there's a different thing for Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao that takes into consideration the SINSS and facility studies and for the interconnection process. So it's regionalized okay. for NGCP. So, but it really is a case of um, technology uh, lagging or policy lagging technology. Nick, um, in what way do you think technology should drive policy? Well, when photovoltaic panels first came out, um, in Hawaii, where I'm from, they came out with net energy metering, which meant, and it was retail. So if it costs you 30 cents to buy electricity, they would credit you 30 cents for the for your photovoltaic panels, which was insane. The utility took a took a brutal beating, almost went into the death spiral because of that, because policymakers didn't understand what photovoltaic technology meant on the regulatory policy wise. And in, in Hawaii, on our island, Hawaiian Electric is a monopoly. So they're guaranteed by the Public Utility Commission a profit. So over the past 10, 15 years, policy on just solar panels has evolved. So they went to a lower NEM, a wholesale NEM, and then they knocked the NEM out completely, all right? So energy storage, is even more complicated than solar panels. Solar panel, you, you, the sun comes up and makes power. Every, the policy makers get that. Wind blows, wind turbine makes power, they get that. When you talk about how to connect that to energy storage, to firm power, to the financial benefit of the utility, the developer and the rate payer, policies have not been developed for that yet including across most of the U.S. and Europe, all right? These are mistakes that are in place across Europe and across the United States. The Philippines is in an early enough situation, hopefully, that they can learn from these mistakes, begin doing hybrid energy and energy storage, start an understanding how to connect that to the grid. Now, a big part of the problem is your policymakers are not industry experts. They're not technology people. The people that currently do the interconnect studies are doing very basic stuff. All right, How to actually blend what's going on with the grid simultaneously, what's going on with renewable energy, simultaneously with the state of charge and the energy storage, that's beyond most of their abilities. So I, I really don't have an easy answer for that other than that people like David and Hansel are on the front lines they're seeing this if if there's cooperation and education that can go on with policy makers and those who actually have to review the designs hopefully an understanding of how to do this can happen because that's really a key thing really few people know how to do this so um I've got a bunch more questions, and I find this topic really interesting, so I can go on for hours, but I'm sure you all have your own thoughts as to what you want to ask our experts. So if there's anybody now who wants to ask a question, uh, we've got one over there. Um, and, and again, you know, even while I'm talking and asking questions, if you want to, start waving your hands and I'll, I'll eventually spot you. We just seem to have a dearth of microphones in this one. 
Hi, Sarah, David, Hansel, Nick. Uh, quick question. Well, I came in a little bit late, so I don't know. Uh, this goes to you, Nick, uh, with your experience. So what would your solution be for a uh, uh, storage type of system? Would it be the batteries or what, moving forward, what would be the best way? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I know what everyone's going to say to that question, but surprise me, Nick. All right. You have to know, the number one thing you need to know is your load and what the characteristics of your load is, be it for a house, a business, at the substation or the utility level, you need to know that. Because right now, I don't want to ding these guys too hard, but most battery storage suppliers, their answer is, okay, just buy more battery. Just make it bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, that doesn't work that way because loads are not some kind of static thing like when you turn on a flashlight or you, you, you get into an electric car. Loads can be tied to uh, Ayala lands chillers as well as, you know, so chillers, VRF, all this air conditioning. Those loads have huge spikes that can occur during the day, begin to start in the morning and go in the afternoon. So you have to understand your load. If you understand your load, and especially if it has these huge energy spikes, those energy spikes are the enemy of batteries. They'll kill them fast. Hybrid energy storage, you are designing to absorb that surge. And when that surge is absorbed, you then hand it off to like LTO or LFP, right? LTO and LFP, you protect them with a shock absorber on the front end, they'll last for decades. Hansel will start nodding his head and say, yep, my battery will last for decades, all right? Yeah, but the key thing about that is, if it lasts for decades, well, how does that, what does that mean for return on investment? It means you actually get one that's to the benefit of the rate payer, the developer, and the utility. Yeah, and just would like to add that in this clean energy transition, we need all the help that we can from storage, lithium ion, and maybe flow batteries, whatever type of energy storage. Because I believe energy storage is really key in this clean, clean, clean energy transition. So may it be whatever type of energy storage, we need all the help that we can. So I think what I heard those two say was it depends what you want to use your energy storage for. You do your analytics and then you design your storage to actually match what you need it for. Uh, and anybody else got a question at this point in time? Okay. Uh, oh, there's somebody. I can't. Oh, there. Okay. Um, you mentioned about the problem with storage. Um, will a nationwide smart grid system help with the storage problem? Sorry, could you repeat that question, please? Uh, nationwide smart grid. So Vietnam is thinking about implementing a smart grid system, and would that be too far-fetched, or would that be a possibility? So Nick, if you could touch on this, and could you explain to the audience what a smart grid is before you answer the question? All right, I'm going to refer to this as the mythical smart grid. You'll, you'll find definitions that don't really explain what a smart grid is. A smart grid, you would assume, can dynamically and intelligently control the distribution of load, but, it, at, but it's already bottlenecked at the substation. We have substations all over. That's not bi-directional power flow, all right? And the more renewable energy you have below the substation, the less power you're getting from the generator. It's to the point where in Europe or in the United States, during the day, no power comes from gas or oil filed plants out to the houses or the business. So the smart grid is supposed to balance and manage that. But I'll tell you right now, functionally, the way the distribution grid is constructed right now, the smart grid as it's being touted on television or wherever is impossible, all right? That's not realistic. What you're stuck with is traditional utility distribution methods through SCADA out to the substations, which is a, a, a severely lagging 
And then when you throw renewable energy on, on that, now you're causing the grid to yin yang against itself, against the load, against the renewable energy source that can actually destroy the grid. In California, all these fires that were blamed on PG&E who then claimed bankruptcy was because they were overpressurized during the day, resulting in arc faults to the ground starting fires. So the smart grid A does not exist. The smart grid cannot exist without energy storage. Energy storage allows you to set up reactive, instantly reactive responses to loads. That's what it's ultimately going to be. How to get there, a lot of those pieces exist today, but frankly, it's ridiculously expensive at this point in time. Yeah, I, I, I think I just heard Nick say uh, it's a long way off. Um, David, you mentioned that Vivant had interests in uh, distribution. I wondered whether you had any insights into whether the distribution grid in the Philippines was ready yet to be smart. Is it ready? Not yet. Does distribution want to be smart? Yes. The supporting infrastructure is massive. Not only do does uh, the distribution utility need to install or upgrade its existing facilities, but they also need to install smart equipment and measuring equipment to make people's homes and load centers smart. You can't make the distribution utility smart without having the other end smart as well. You'll just be wasting energy in CapEx. Do we want it? The answer is yes. Can we do it? I hope sooner than later. Oh, that's that's a, a great answer, and thanks for the question. I'm going to pivot a moment, um, I think, and, and let's talk about battery prices. Because uh, I know from the, the company I'm on the board of that uh, they're going up right now. So, uh, Hansel, maybe you can give us some insight into what's driving battery prices at the moment. And uh, can you wave your hands in a crystal ball and, and tell us what's going to happen in the future? Yeah, the, yeah the, the most difficult question of all, prices. So right now, in terms of battery sales, we're seeing that the drivers are, one, the demand for battery sales. So utility scale battery storage is kind of competing with EV. So main portion of the supply right now are going to the EV sector. So a portion of it only goes to the utility scale. So that's one demand. Second is uh, the price of raw materials. So when those uh, prices increase, battery cell prices also increase. Third one would be supply chain. Right now we're having difficulties meeting uh, some of our commitment because of supply chain issues. Logistic, shipping, those kind of things. Is that being driven by uh, China's COVID-0 policy? You're correct. <laughs> yeah, as someone who lives in Hong Kong, I get first-hand knowledge of China's zero COVID policy. So, uh, Crystal Ball, where are we going? Uh, we're hoping. We're hoping that uh, the battery prices globally would kind of stabilize this year. We've seen uh, uh, at least a 20 to 25 percent increase monthly in the first quarter of this, of this year. And right now, I think it's starting to stabilize and we, we hope that it remains that way until next year or maybe the year after that we would, would see a, a decrease in terms of battery prices. So let me turn this over to you, David. As a consumer of the batteries in your projects, at what point are you going to say lithium iron, yeah, we loved it, but it's too expensive. I'm going to have to look at other storage technologies to put in my projects. We're actually doing that now, Sarah. We're not limited to lithium ion because of it's getting pricier. We're looking at mechanical bat uh, mechanical storage systems. We're looking at Is that flywheels? Yes. We're looking at alternative battery and storage solutions as we speak, including um, hydro. So we're not we're technology agnostic in terms of storage, but we're looking at at least six storage solutions. Okay, Nick, do you have any views on this? Well, 
as, as I was saying, this, this whole panel discussion is based on hybrid energy storage, which effect, effectively means hybrid energy. If we have an energy source that can connect to the grid and give reliable power that meets interconnect requirements, we're, we're well on our way. It's just that the, to get to that point requires a, a bit more technology, a bit more cooperation, which these guys, speaking to them offline, for the, the amount of cooperation these guys are willing to do is fantastic, and it's, it's what it's needed versus competition. Um, so I'm hopeful uh, for the Philippines because the Philippines is early enough that it doesn't have to make the mistakes. I'm also hopeful because of the willingness to collab collaborate and to be collegial amongst the different organizations that are trying to sell it. So I'm going to leave it there at that. Thanks. Uh, could you give it back to David because I'm going to throw my next question to him. So those commodity prices, which are also driving up battery prices, they're, they're driving up other fuel prices as well. They're driving up coal. We've seen massive rises in coal prices in the Philippines. They're driving up gas prices. So presumably that's making your hybrid projects more affordable in the Philippines. Is that the case? It's not really the case. So hybrid projects together with RE is a natural hedge for fluctuating commodity prices. So you're right. Everything's on the high side. The risk is given the high prices now, which tandems with lithium, zinc, and all the commodity prices, which also increases battery and storage prices. The risk is if you install now, you freeze your prices at the peak. And so when commodity prices go up, your hedge becomes the wrong kind of hedge. So it's not as easy as saying, well, I'll go for a hybrid now because I'm shielding myself to commodity prices. But the other extreme ex uh, point is, well, commodity prices are already at the all-time high, therefore it's just going to go down, and installing a battery storage now can harm, your economically, it can harm you economically moving forward. But it's a natural hedge, and that's why we continue to develop battery storage and hybrid projects. Um, Hansa is saying it's end of this year. We're forecasting first quarter, first half of next year for a project for prices to stabilize. Then we can install more. Okay, uh, so that's a real lead into the the question I'd really like to ask you. Uh, as we've seen from the things that Nick was saying, we, we need flexibility in the grid. If we're installing a lot of renewables, then we actually need something that's going to match those renewables and uh, generate when the when the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow. Storage is obviously one of those, and a hybrid storage solution could be a dispatchable load, but so could, say, gas. Where we are here in the Philippines, you know, we, we see a lot of development of gas. Uh, it's not mentioned much in this forum, but I was in a, a forum in Thailand only about a month ago where pretty much every single person was talking about building gas in Asia, including the Philippines. So as a developer, what's your perspective? Do you think that hybrid projects are a good competition with gas? Do you think we need both? Tell me a little about your views on this. We need both. At the moment, gas will eventually be more accepted. Right now, prices are making gas projects more prohibitive. Now, gas is needed for a certain type of demand. Currently, gas is used as base load in the Philippines, not necessarily its design use. Gas is better for mid-merit and peaker. RE, by definition, is a must-dispatch capacity. So while we're building our RE portfolio, leveling it off and mitigating that intermittency via storage, we need gas to level that load. Without gas, RE can just make the grid so unstable. But we're an importer of gas. We don't have the infrastructure yet. So as a natural hedge, you build more capacity now for RE and storage, and you level that cost over time. And that's a protection against gas fluctuation. But do we need gas? Yes, we still need gas. It's very interesting to me 
the portfolio you're building, do you think we should be building portfolios as companies within the Philippines or policies so that the Philippines as a country builds that portfolio? As I understand your questions are, uh, should the private sector develop our power projects? Yes. So should, should you, Vivant, develop your portfolio to manage your, your risk? Or should we have a portfolio of renewable company here, storage company here, gas company here, so that the combination in the grid manages this risk? I'll go for our company developing our own portfolio. We have our own load requirements, we have our own customers to manage, and those customers have varying needs. And if my company relies on another company to provide the storage that I need, I need to pass on that to my customer. Whereas if I have that capacity and capability inside my company, inside our organization, we manage that portfolio as a whole, and we can provide better services to our customer. Sometimes that customer is the general public, ourselves, our own households, when we supply to the grid. Sometimes they're industrial zones with specific load requirements, which we can cater to their, which we can cater the solution based on their need. As opposed to me relying on another company, well, you need, do you need to provide this company battery? This guy needs ancillary. It becomes, without someone actually wrapping the risk, there's so much opportunity lost, so much cost wastage, as opposed to one company managing the portfolio, providing the solution, one solution catered to a specific company, and that company, in our case, us, being solely responsible to come up with a solution and being accountable for that solution. Brilliant. That's a, a great discussion. Do you want to say something, Hansel? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, maybe to answer your uh, question, sir, question earlier about gas. I think, yes, we need gas, especially in this green energy transition. But do we need gas 20 years from now? That I don't know. And that I have, to see. I have yet to see. And, and that, of course, is going to be the commercialization issue. Because if we have to build LNG terminals, if we have to contract with gas suppliers, it, it, I see this, this real dichotomy between getting those pieces of infrastructure financed with as base load and as certain a revenue as possible and the actual needs of the Philippines. That's right. David, did you have any views on how that could be done? That's a complex matter, sir. Um, this show is the future of energy show. We can only come up with our, we can only contribute our own institutions um, efforts to make the future happen sooner. For us, we see issues raised by distribution utilities, which we cater. We hear issues by customers, energy prices, stability. We do our best. We communicate with industry players. We participate in forums like this to increase the awareness that Solutions need to be had, not just by one company, but everyone. Everyone needs to take a part. And you're right, before the talk, you were saying that, hey, this is a big task. Everyone needs to collaborate for that solution. Whatever that solution is, yet, sir, we think that we're contributing to it. But we need everyone's help. That's great. So, we are slowly running out of time. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes. I think we've got one more question here. Hi, Sarah. Um, being a researcher, I'm hoping that you can answer this question. It goes back, it's linked to your idea, which is actually not a bad idea, by the policy driving the, the development of each uh, energy. But let me bring it back to the, what you were just discussing with the, the development of each, uh, with the, should the policy dictate what is to be developed in terms of like energy, renewable energy, battery storage, et cetera, et cetera. The question that you just asked your panels, the other panelists. So uh, my question is, 
it's linked to the CSP. So the CSP is uh, is in place right now. The competitive selection process, which is basically an auction forum uh, for energy from the distribution to provide to the distribution utilities. Okay. Um, greenfield projects with the CSP in place. Does it or does it not hinder the greenfield project development? Is that a question? Is that a question for me or my panel? Um, to you, I'm hoping you can help answer this and enlighten us on this first. Yeah, I, I, I've spent a lot of time looking at CSP projects and, and the incentives. Um, and I, I think the answer to your question is it's very complicated here in the Philippines because CSPs are not the only way to get commercialization for a new project. Um, yes, in a way, you, you may have an old project competing with a new project in a CSP, and the old depreciated project is very likely to win. But at some point, you run out of those projects. They all get, they all get contracted up. And then the only thing, so if Morelco goes out again with a really large tender for another 1,000 megawatts or so, are there really a 1,000 megawatts of old, uncontracted projects which are able to compete in that tender? And then the question is, you know, if not, then you, by definition, will have Greenfield competing with Greenfield, um, and then we will get the new projects that you need. But I think, I, and I asked a question of, of Chris Starling uh, yesterday, uh, which was actually very similar, and I'll repeat back what he said to me. I asked him whether the, um, whether the, the renewable energy auctions ought to be just one auction for all technologies. Um, and he said, and I was surprised by his answer, but I really liked his logic. He said no, because there are specific needs in the Philippines at the moment that need specific types of technologies. And having specific technological auctions is one way to achieve that. And I thought that was a really good answer. Um, and I think it's that you can apply that back to CSP. CSPs do actually allow the DU to tender for the specific kind of thing that they need. Um, and, and, and that is an advantage of the CSP process. Um, I'm going to throw it over to David um, and I'll see whether he has any other views on this. We see the CSP as, uh, as an avenue to motivate and incentivize new builds. As we've seen, CSPs require new builds to address future demands. As a generator with the procurement uh, demands or projected demands of the use, we know what's generally there. A CSP gives us an avenue of what is really needed. So from a general point of view, you go to the DOE website, you see the projected demand of the entire Philippines split up by every distribution utility. You prepare yourself, well, I'm going to build so much solar, so much battery, wind, etc. Every CSP gives us, the, gives us a view of what is really needed. And the CSP motivates us to actually cater to what is needed. And a CSP is also a protection for us because we don't want, we don't have unlimited resources. And so the CSP gives us an idea of what is actually required as opposed to overbuilding and having crap cast assets. So is that the is from the developer perspective or the distribution utility perspective? Uh, I'm a developer. Okay. Because from, from what I see of the CSP, yes, you're correct. It does apply. It does give some of those advantages. But in terms of... Uh, giving the country energy security, does that help? Because from what I can see of CSPs at this current stage in time, it's a uh, distribution utility or electric cooperative giving, a, giving out a set contract to, a, uh, to be, be bid out and to be, won, to be won by one con developer. And if that developer does not reach the COD of this contract in time, does that give energy security? That, 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 that it hinders the country, it hinders the development, you know? And um, let, let, me, let, me, let me pause you there, because I think you're, you're kind of lecturing to us as well. Um, but I, 
I, I would say that one of the disadvantages of the way the Philippines works compared to, say, other electricity markets is that it is often one, one DU and one generator. And often in the past, it has been one coal-fired power station, one gas-fired power station between these two parties. And it has been a very rare project. Um, the, um, the GN Power one was the exception that proves, proves the rule, I think, where you've actually essentially had slices of a power station going to the, the different ECs or the, or the different DUs. Um, and in a way, that's a shame because the WESM was set up to allow, you know, modern parts of megawatts of power to go from wherever they needed to go to whoever needed them. But in the real world, you actually have to get financing. And in the real world, you actually have to um, have a firm enough contract if you're going to build something that's big enough um, to, to gain the financing, to go, you know, to go to the bank, to buy your EPC and, and to actually build your project. Um, and having those contracts in a developing market with a massively growing electricity demand, even, even now, you know, coming back after the pandemic, we're seeing the demand rising quite rapidly. You actually need that level of certainty uh, so, so that these projects can be built. And I think that having those single contracts does allow the LDs and the other uh, terms and conditions within the contracts to ensure, I mean, if you've not been involved in one of these processes, you may not know what all the performance bonds this country just loves performance bonds. Like, there's more performance bonds here than any other country I've ever dealt with. Um, and I think they do give you certainty that that project would, would actually be built. Do, do any of my panel want to, to add anything on this matter? Variables. There's just so many variables. When a CSP comes out, there's a known condition that you think you have. Six months later, that condition can change drastically. David's talking about liability. Any developer responding to that is, is, is saying they're willing to take the liability. So if a developer says, okay, we need energy storage, he calls up Fluence, right? He was saying earlier, they wanna have all the expertise in house. That means the design, the load capacity planning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if they go to him and say, we think it's this, but he looks at it and says, no, we, we, we don't think it's X, we think it's Y, right? And they don't want to take the liability for going with what they said, and they don't want to go with the liability for what he said, all right? That knowledge, that expertise to put that together is very thin worldwide, all right? And for either one of these guys to take the liability requires a tremendous amount of research, knowing the variables, and having the contract or whatever the agreement has with enough modularity in it so that they are given some room to adapt if the conditions change and it's not their fault. Thanks, Just my thanks, 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 Nick. Let David uh, have a quick go because we are running out of time. So CSP is a real challenge for developers. Now, you mentioned energy security, but you also mentioned what happens if a developer does not deliver a project on COD. The checks and balances are not at COD, but certain milestones. And if a properly executed CSP is implemented, the distribution utility will have a backup. They'll have a second bidder ready to jumpstart development anyway. Certain milestones not met, you go to the next bidder. Now, in addition to that, just remember that for CSP, CSP, the goal of the CSP is to strike a balance between supply and demand. And so developers are always on the lookout. If there's a project delayed, that developer will have a backup plan. Or another developer is the backup plan to get that uh, to, to match that demand. The CSP is the solution. Uh, thank, thanks, David. Um, we have three minutes. I think if there's one more question actually on the topic of um, hybrid renewable storage, is, are you on that topic? No, he's not. 
Anyone actually want to ask a storage hybrid renewable question? Because we were veering quite a long way off our topic there. Yeah, we've got one at the front here. I arrived late, so probably this is already, or this was discussed already. I would like to know the future of gel type battery. Will it die a natural death? The, the future of something type batteries? Gel type. Gel type. Gen type. Gel, gel batteries? <laughs> oh, so you sound like a lead acid guy. Absorb glass mat, gel. All right. No, it's not the death of lead acid. Lead acid has a huge role to play going into the future. Now, it's not been a topic of discussion here, but there are advanced lead acid batteries now that don't dry out. The biggest problem with gel, absorbed glass mat, flooded cell, is the VRLA bulk burps. Every time you burp, you dry out that battery. And that battery is less, is getting weaker and weaker. If you have a battery that doesn't burp and it's lead acid, you can get decades of use out of it. A properly designed application of advanced lead acid at one-fourth to one-fifth the cost of lithium does have a major role to play. And it's being used in different parts of the world today. It's not being used here in the Philippines yet, but that does exist. So gel is fine. Thanks, Nick. I, I actually have um, I actually have those old-fashioned batteries on my boat where, where I live. Um, we are out of time. Um, I think if there are other questions that any of you want to put to our panelists, come up and grab them afterwards. I'm sure they'll be happy. Uh, we've, we've had a fantastic range of knowledge here. Um, I'm sure we could go on for ages, but I'm hungry. I'm sure other people are hungry, so I'm going to wrap up there. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was such a very insightful and much needed discussion. So uh, thank you, Sarah, Hans, Nick, and uh, David. So uh, to our audience, if you've got further questions after Sarah finishes her, her lunch, then you can approach her. She's around. And um, we'll proceed on this uh, energy storage theater at 2 p.m. Thank you.